Today we're reviewing English Venetian Red by Schmenka. What's up, Liron here. Thank you for joining me in another episode of The Paint Show. And today we're gonna look at English Venetian Red by Schmincke. This is a paint I haven't gotten to use enough so far, but I love it. Every time I use it, I really, really, really love it. I packed it again, packaged it again, just so that you can see the packaging. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is a very dark, brown red color uh, and what I like about it is its strength it's just strong all across it's staining it's uh, opaque it's just a punch of color um, and I think it's really good for maybe monochromatic studies and and things like this because it has that range of values now because of its dominance you do need to uh, make sure you use it in the right context possible. Like if you're mixing with other paints that are really weak, uh, you're, you may gonna you may have some trouble with it. But in any case, this is a paint that uh, I really like. It's similar. The consistency, the the um, uh, ingredients are similar to their burnt sienna, but there's a slight difference that we're gonna cover in just a moment. Okay. So I think you may like this one. I think it works perfectly well for rooftops, things like this. If you wanna get that orangey European, uh, maybe Italian kind of rooftop style, the terracotta. I believe it's called, um, then this is a really good one. Uh, so with that being said, let's look at some paint information. Here it is uh, in the Schmincke brochure, uh, English Venetian Red. Let's go uh, over the description first, then we'll look at some characteristics. So orange colored brown red, very color intense, opaque pigment, a synthetic red iron oxide, very good light fastness. So uh, we'll begin with the pigment, that's PR101, and that is a very common, that's uh, red iron oxide, very common common uh, pigment for browns and, and reds, you know, uh, brown reds, all of these, uh, the different spectrum of these, uh, which is also why this is a series one paint. It's a very simple, relatively pigment, pigment along with the um, the ochres and, and the umbros, uh, relatively simple ones uh, that aren't very expensive. Now, uh, the light fastness is five out of five, which I think is great because a lot of the Schmincke paints aren't uh, like that. Now, it's fun to compare it to uh, Burnt Sienna because Burnt Sienna also uses PR101 and we did review that in the past. The only difference is that there's a bit of uh, Pigment Black 9, which is uh, uh, I forgot the, the official name of it, but it's basically charred bones. Um, so this one is only uh, the red iron oxide, uh, which is interesting, the difference between these two. I wouldn't necessarily guess that was the, the difference. Uh, but in any case, this one is opaque. Okay, so that's if, if that puts you off, just it's important to know. Uh, and it's also uh, very staining. So it's, it's going to be harder to lift. You can see her again, very strong, very opaque, strongly pigmented. I personally love these kinds of paints. Uh, I think a good uh, use for this one could be just for a monochromatic painting because you get that uh, large range of values. I don't even think this swatch here does it justice. It can get uh, even darker than that if I'm not mistaken uh, from, from my experimentations so far. Uh, so in any case, uh, if you want a really strong, highly pigmented uh, orange red and you don't necessarily care for uh, it being too opaque, this could be a great choice. I do see this one used for uh, rooftops, like Italian rooftops, uh, you know, Venetian. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the Florence rooftops. That's that's a very good color for that. So in any case, now we can uh, get on to experimentation. So uh, let's get started. I'm just gonna start by swatching it out here. Uh, as usual, uh, I do wonder what kind of mixes I'm gonna try uh, using it for. So we're gonna see about that. I'm probably try uh, a few primary colors. Uh, especially because this one isn't really, it's kind of an, you know, an, a dirty orangey. Um, so we'll have to uh, give it a shot. So let's start with this section here and you'll just get to see uh, what this paint looks like. So it's a beautiful one, I really like it. Uh, I didn't even use watercolor paper just for this little piece of paper. So it's just a normal kind of paper. Um, so this is at its lightest version, no you know, barely any paint here, so more water. The paper I'm using is actually a Winsor Newton Cotman and look how it flows. This is due to the 
uh, the paper probably. Uh, just how it keeps everything floating <laughs> uh, on its top. You can see I, I can literally move the pigment because it stays on top of the paper. This is a very flimsy paper but it's good for these kinds of uh, tests I guess. Um, I also enjoy it for some very quick sketches. I find that uh, as you improve even uh, bad materials, quote unquote, um, you can produce some nice things with them. I did uh, make a nice portrait painting with this one uh, that uh, if you've been following me, I think I shared it somewhere though, I'm not sure, maybe I haven't even shared it yet uh, on Instagram, but I will soon if I haven't. Um, so I did a decent uh, portrait with this one. Uh, just a quick one, you can't get more than maybe two layers. Uh, so in any case, let's just strengthen uh, this right side so you can better see what this looks like. But as you can see really it's kind of a, it reminds me of Schmincke's Burnt Sienna. It's a, an orange that has maybe a bit of, you know, it's not a pure pure uh, orange, so a bit of dirt in it. And next up I want to do some uh, wet and wet as always. So I'm just gonna pre-wet uh, this area here. I could literally just pop this one into uh, an existing palette, but I didn't for some reason. So we're gonna just continue experimentation that way. I don't even think I have a palette with available space right now uh, here with me, so in any case. Uh, so I'm just pre-wetting the surface and again you don't need too much water for this kind of surface because it doesn't soak it up. It's not really a thirsty paper like uh, if you do that with Arsh or Saunders Waterford, uh, you really won't, uh, you know, uh, you won't be able to, the paper doesn't soak it up. So anyway, now due to the paper once again, notice how the paint spreads because there's just a lot of liquid here, a lot of water. So it makes it kind of float up top. Um, and the dispersion itself isn't too much, you know. Uh, I do see some interesting patterns uh, being created, but nothing uh, out of the ordinary. Uh, for example, the perlin uh, red of Daniel Smith really, uh, perlin red deep, I believe, it would really spread out with veins. And I did read that it should do that. This one is less veiny, I guess. Um, I don't really care about the specific pattern, wet and wet. I just wants the, you know, the gradual change when I do wet and wet, so I don't really care about the specific kind of weight. This is too zoomed in for me, but I just, I know some people care about that, so I do want to show you uh, some of that, you know. Uh, but for me, I, my approach is just, you know, get it to be as dark as necessary, uh, make sure everything is relatively uh, even, and then get some variety, I guess, in the in the colors. Uh, so in any case, this is the our wet and wet. I'm just gonna move this aside, and we're gonna do some dry brush. Now, unlike my Canson Monval uh, sketchbook here, it's gonna be a little easier getting a dry brush because this uh, does have a bit of a texture, not not that strong of a texture, but it does have some texture on it. So you can see here, uh, and all I do, uh, this is, you know, some people ask me about dry brush, and I did plan on making a video on that, but basically what you wanna do is, I'm gonna clean the brush now, I'm just, cleaning it and, and drying it almost completely, okay? Uh, it's just a bit moist. And then I'm gonna dip here and I'm gonna try it out and you just get to see if you have too straight of a line, uh, or too even of a line, for example, like this. This is pretty wet still. So what I wanna do uh, is just dip it into more of the paint uh, and then test it out and you see it becomes a little more broken, a little more like the dry brush effect uh, that many of us know and love, but it's still pretty even. So what I'm gonna do is just dab it on the towel, but but I, I'm just gonna do this, okay, on the towel. Uh, and then I get less moist in it, and then you get the more of a dry uh, texture, okay? And I will, again, I will make a video on it. I'm still working on that, um, but uh, this is all there is basically to, uh, to dry brush. You just need to have uh, as little um, water on the brush as, as possible so that you can still produce something but but then the the least amount of water possible. So in any case this is it. I think we really this overkilled this uh, dry brush. So next up I'm gonna try some mixes. And I've got my Daniel Smith based palette here. So I think what could be fun maybe as a first uh, attempt maybe would be to mix it with some of the Carbazol Violet because these two are uh, I believe opposites on the color wheel. Uh, or loose opposites, I guess. Uh, it could be interesting to test it out here. So just gonna let these blend, blend together. And notice how I, I really like this combination. Um, you know, this one reminds me a bit of the uh, quinacridone burnt orange. Of course, it's really different. But but just uh, talking about the color itself, there is some um, a bit of a similarity. So these work really well together, just like with the Cronacodone Burnt Orange. Uh, let's try it out maybe with some uh, Thalo Blue, uh, just because I do like the way these combine together. Uh, 
So you can see these will neutralize each other a little more, uh, probably. I'm gonna try maybe a darker mix. I'm gonna do it here on my palette. So I'm taking some of that uh, Venetian red, getting a bit more of that. And you can see it gets really dark. And I'm sure with the Carbazole Violet, it'll get even darker because uh, the violet is very dark as well. And you can see some of the properties here of the paint, how it covers the, you know, the thalo. I hope you can see this. It's barely visible, but it is visible. Uh, how it covers the thalo blue. Uh, let's try it with a bit of yellow now. Still a bit contaminated by the blue, but it's barely noticeable. Um, so if I grab some of the... We got here some uh, hands of yellow medium. I'm just gonna let these two blend together and I'm gonna clean up the hands of yellow medium a little more just to get a pure color. There we go. So I've got this one and it's really pure. And you see these mix uh, nicely together, create this kind of a rusty dead orange. Uh, I, I wouldn't say this one uh, needs to necessarily be mixed too much. I think it's it has some great uses uh, on its own. I wouldn't I would try to avoid uh, over mixing it um, because it can be tricky. You know, it's a bit of a dull orange, so it's already a secondary color and it's dull. Um, so it already has some you know a lot of uh, colors in it. You know, and I did get a comment about how it's not really it doesn't really work that way. That the you know the warm uh, warm blue or red blue don't really have uh, red or yellow in them um, but that's kind of the end result that I see very consistently so it's a good way of calculating um, what the results gonna be like okay so uh, I hope that makes sense so even though let's say a warm blue doesn't physically have red in it it does influence its appearance so uh, I did want to mention that now let's try mixing it with some green so I think I'll use here a bit of, um, I have sap green, and I think it'll work really nicely with sap green, kind of similarly to uh, the burnt sienna maybe. Well, it does have a bit of red in it, so I'm just gonna grab a bit of the pure paint here, I'll let it mix together. So you can see this very dull brown green. I'm gonna try it out with uh, some undersea green. Uh, I think undersea green is a, is a very interesting paint that I still haven't gotten the chance to use enough. Uh, it doesn't get as dark, so I mix it usually with a lot of violet, and, which is why you can see that it's very violet-ish. So I'm gonna have to work a little here to clean it up, but I will. Um, so if I get a bit of that, so that's close to pure. There we go. So that's what we've got here uh, in terms of the um, undersea green. It's, you can see it's a very muted green, so... Uh, and I'm gonna just grab some of that. And this, this is an interesting combo. So a lot of oranges and a lot of... Uh, I'm gonna try a bit of uh, French Ultramarine, perhaps, just to see. This is one of the classic ones we should have probably tried, because they will probably neutralize each other. So I've got here some French Ultramarine. I'm gonna mix it up here. And these really should create a gray, because, it, again, it's similar to the burnt sienna mixture. And as you know me, I don't care too much about the particular paint. Uh, I think a lot of things can work in a lot of variations, so I'm never too caught up on paints. Uh, I do enjoy uh, just mixing and playing around with them, so which is why I did this show. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is zoom out and we'll kind of conclude everything we've done. So this is what you can expect of this uh, color. Now, I, when I just started with it, I was a bit confused with that and Caput Mortem, which they call uh, the Indian Red. But the Indian Red is much more dead and muted, so it's not really the same thing. The Indian Red looks more like this than like this, okay? so. Um, I really like this one. I think it's a matter of testing and seeing what uses you can find for it, um, what it mixes well with. You can see the different patterns that are created. This is partially due to the, the sketchbook and the paper itself, but also the paint. Um, and I think really this is one of those paints, I, I think it would look great for rooftops, like really a classic paint for um, for um, Italian rooftops, let's say Florence, uh, Venetia, you know, as the name suggests. Um, I think it can work really well for monochromatic paintings as well because it can become pretty dark, uh, which is a good characteristic that I always appreciate. Uh, and this is it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let's uh, wrap it up. So this is it for today's episode. I really hope you enjoyed this one and maybe you will give this one a try. I'm gonna put a link uh, in the description box. That's an affiliate link. If you get it through uh, my link, I get a really small commission 
and you pay the exact same price so everyone wins um, and just again another one I think you need to be smart about the way you mix it I don't think it'll work if you're just planning out on building a basic palette of the primaries and maybe two more colors I would go with a more transparent kind of quinacridone burnt orange Daniel Smith style uh, and not necessarily such a strong uh, very high tinting uh, color but if you are um, like a, a paint fanatic and you want to add this one to your repertoire it could be a really good choice okay so I really hope you enjoyed this episode don't forget to check out my beginners drawing course in the description box below that's the first the first thing I want, uh, I want to make sure that you don't miss because I've added the how to shade course. I talked about it a bit uh, in my, on my emails that I sent. So if you want to learn how to shade and how to draw beautiful, beautiful drawings from observation, be sure to check it out in the description box. Also, I'm going to put a link to my podcast and to my Patreon page and all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, and this is it for today. I will see you again in another episode of The Paint Show and in another vid real soon.